Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, Phil, Italia, um, Phil Italia Symposium on Innovation in Aerospace, Present and Future. A coloro che sono collegati con noi dall'Italia, buon pomeriggio e benvenuti al simposio di uh, Phil Italia su innovazione in aerospazio presente e futuro. My name is Antonio Paesano and I have the privilege to host this symposium that is promoted by the Italian Consulate in Philadelphia and the Italian government which we greatly thank. The symposium is also organized by Phil Italia International, a prestigious Italian-American nonprofit organization founded in 1987 to promote and preserve the Italian culture, heritage, language, and history throughout the world. I also like to um, acknowledge uh, the IT fir uh, firm HyperDesign for uh, handling the present connection, social media, and other IT aspects of uh, this symposium. Uh, today, we are very lucky to have five speakers from uh, uh, companies and the university that are uh, leaders in aerospace. Uh, we will hear from them about uh, the progress done in uh, uh, technologies for aerospace and uh, the expectations for the near future. I greatly thank uh, today's uh, prestigious speakers for their time and sharing their knowledge. Uh, so to uh, our audience today, I say fasten your uh, seat belt and enjoy your flight through aerospace technology. Uh, before we dive into the presentations, let me introduce Dr. Essa Patrizia Calanchini Monti, She's the director of uh, the educational office of the Consulate General of Italy in Philadelphia. Please, Dr. Is. Good morning, thank you. I'm very pleased uh, to represent the Italian Consulate in Philadelphia and to extend the greetings and best wishes of our Consul General uh, of Italy, Pier Forlano. And also to inform you that today's symposium has been officially included in the catalog of events of the International Day of the Italian Scientific, Scientific Research. Uh, I would like to say that we really appreciate your efforts to portray Italy not only as a country rich in cultural and artistic heritage, but also as a leader in scientific and technological developments. It is great for us to, to have events within the Chow Philadelphia program, dealing with scientific events, as well as with topics dealing with sustainability, which is one of the main challenges worldwide at the moment and in our country as well. On behalf of the Consulate General of Italy in Philadelphia, I would like to thank Phil Italia International for the fruitful cooperation with the Consulate and also to draw the attention of today's participants to all the other events of the Chow Philadelphia catalog, which ranges from literature to design, from cinema studies to scientific research. And I very warmly encourage you to look them up in the Chow Philadelphia website, as it provides a really, really rich offer of interesting opportunities to debate about a wide range of topics always keeping Italy and the Italian uh, and Italian American community at the center. I'm also pleased to remind you that in 2021, we are celebrating the, one, uh, uh, the um, uh, 160th anniversary of the diplomatic relationship between Italy and the United States, which represent again, a further opportunity to emphasize the positive cooperation between our two countries. Thank you very much and uh, buon lavoro. Thank you, Dottoressa. And, uh, and now it's um, my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Pasquale Nestico. He's professor of medicine at Jefferson University and uh, is the founder and president emeritus of uh, Phil Italia International. Uh, please, Dr. Nestico. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Excellent. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. S. Colanchini-Monti. Thank you, General Counsel Forlano, and friend of uh, my personal friend and friend of uh, Philippa International. Thank you, Antonio, for uh, your brilliant career, as well as your dedication to the uh, mission of the Philita International. And uh, I bring to you also a saluti. Uh, welcome from our esteemed president, Paola Bonavitacola. And uh, hello to all the speakers of incredible talent. And uh, I am certain that will personally enjoy the uh, presentation. I'm in the midst of patience. You can tell the way I'm dressed. And uh, Philitalia International has uh, 33 years of experience of the uh, third sector. It's 99.99% .99 volunteer. And our mission is language and culture and services to others. Our motto, M-O-T-T-O, it's humility, justice, and honesty. We have a beautiful center with a in history of Italian immigration museum hosted by our, housed by our center. Please come to Philadelphia, we'll, uh, we'll treat you nicely. And we'll show you the city, how beautiful Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia city is. We have a 22 sites uh, between Italy and uh, the United States. We're also looking for to expand in South America. We have an incredible team. Congratulations for today. And we really, really thank you for your, uh, for your presentation ahead of time. Thank you, Dr. Nestico. Let, um, let me uh, introduce now the first speaker. Today, Mr. Todd Hammer, a, a brief, very brief introduction uh, um, because of the little time we have today. Um, Mr. Todd Hammer is uh, currently uh, uh, founding president and CEO of Belotti America, a subsidiary of Belotti uh, uh, Italy, um, a world leader in the design and manufacture of five axis machine tools for aerospace, automotive, nautical, and plastics sector. Mr. Hammer work, work, uh, works with the uh, uh, market leaders uh, such as Boeing, uh, uh, General Atomics, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, SpaceX, Tesla, and their supply chains. chains. He's also uh, been a director of CMP, Texas chapter, and co-general co chair of CMP. Uh, please, Mr. Hammer. There we go. Okay, I'm on the wrong. Wrong slide. Pardon me just a second. That proves we are live. Exactly. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this event. Uh, I've, I've proudly represented uh, Italy for decades uh, in the machine tool business. And my presentation is, is just a quick, uh, a quick talk on present and future, but uh, I think it's also important to mention just a little bit of the past and how aerospace ties into automotive going forward. For those participants that 
uh, CNC or NC is, is not a familiar term. Uh, NC is numerical controlled and, and dates back to the 1940s, uh, back when punch cards and, and punch tapes uh, were used by a company called Parsons Corporation in Traverse City, Michigan uh, to uh, start to make helicopter blades using uh, digital uh, input. Uh, fast forward to 1977, and Bilotti Spa was formed in Suicio, uh, which is a small village just outside of Bergamo. In the aerospace industry, uh, we generally uh, see one of two types of machines used, either three axes or five axes. Uh, X and Y indicate the, the length and width of the machine and Z the vertical. More often, uh, we see five axes, which adds a C axis, which rotates around the vertical and an A axis or sometimes referred to B axis, which swivels around the C axis. So here you see a typical three axis application where uh, all of the machining is perpendicular to the face of the part. And here you see a couple typical uh, five axis applications where you're shaping a contour or in this case, uh, trimming and drilling. Here's a little closer view of, of these five axes and, and an example of a typical head, a five axis head. Here's your Z axis your x-axis, y-axis, and turning of this head for C and swiveling of the spindle. What's important is even though an aerospace part, in this, in this case aircraft, uh, may be very thin and, and appear flat uh, because of the makeup of the composites, it's still necessary to mill this uh, with five axes in order to have the cutting tool perpendicular to the uh, composite material. Here's a, a typical uh, application in aerospace where uh, it's difficult to see here, but we've got a machine that has two gantries. Uh, one gantry has a five axis milling head here. And on the other gantry, which is closer to the viewer, a five axis abrasive water jet head. So in this technology, we would use the abrasive water jet head to rough out the geometry of this part and then come behind it and uh, do a, a final trim and, and possibly uh, some milling of, of pockets or drilling of holes. Nowadays, uh, if you've flown on a uh, A350 from Airbus or a 787 from uh, Boeing, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of talk about composites, uh, but yet there's still a tremendous amount of aluminum used uh, in the industry. It's, it's really a, a daily contest on aluminum industry trying to take business away from composites and, and composites uh, trying to drive down the cost of, of the composite uh, components to be competitive with aluminum. Here you see the, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, uh, which, which as you can see, uh, I apologize for the poor image, but uh, by weight, uh, it's, it's an impressive 50% uh, of the weight of the aircraft is made up of composites of one kind or another. Uh, with aluminum and titanium still uh, holding a, a strong uh, percentage of that. Uh, for those from, from Italy and Europe, uh, you'll be very familiar with uh, this slide uh, showing uh, the, the new generation of spacecraft. And, and what all of these have in common with with automotive is uh, it's it's all about lightweighting, uh, lightweighting, 
uh, equals lower cost, whether that's uh, more freight or passengers in aerospace, uh, better gas mileage in automotive, larger payloads in space, uh, not being detectable by, by radar in our defense to protect ourselves or going faster and being safer in motorsports. Uh, here you've got a slide that shows uh, the more satellites uh, that we can stack uh, in, in the spacecraft, the uh, lower the cost. So the, the lighter we can make this entire uh, spacecraft, the more satellites, for example, we can, we can load in here and, and drive that cost down. Uh, this is a very much uh, global uh, industry. As you can see from this slide, we have countries around the world that are participating in, in just this one uh, program. Uh, Italy, uh, setting aside the manufacturing of, of the 787, uh, Italy is a very strong player when it comes to aerospace and automotive in that uh, a great deal of uh, machinery is manufactured in Italy, is used around the world uh, to machine these parts, either at an OEM, uh, tier one, two, three, and, and so forth. Nowadays, uh, present and going into the future, uh, machining accuracy is, is becoming more and more important uh, because in order to drive down cost, uh, we've got to be able to create uh, assemblies that at the OEM during the original assembly, uh, sure, they're, they're easier to assemble, but more important is out in the field or the depot, uh, they, they are uh, bolt-on components, uh, very tight tolerance components uh, that bolt on just as easy as, uh, say, a replacement part for an automotive application at, at a local uh, auto repair shop. And so we're, we're constantly driving uh, towards uh, finer and finer resolution on, on our tolerances. Here's an example of just a, a simple countersink uh, test provided for a composite uh, application. And, and we're down in, into the single digit microns in terms of the accuracy uh, for tests like this, which uh, make it quite easy uh, to bolt on, for example, that new canopy uh, for that fighter jet. Here's a little uh, look into the future. Uh, again, if we use what, what is currently being done in, in commercial aircraft, uh, defense aircraft, uh, spacecraft, uh, this new urban mobility uh, is, is going to be very much like the automotive industry where we need to make them, uh, manufacture them at a, at a much lower cost and have parts that are easily interchangeable. There's a, a view over our famous city of Paris. Uh, why composites? Uh, as you can see from this chart here, uh, steel, which we would all consider to be a very strong material, uh, is at the bottom end in terms of uh, the traditional aluminum and titanium uses. And, and titanium, being the strongest of those, uh, is, is only equal to glass fiber composites until you start orienting uh, those fibers in, in direct, different directions. And then, of course, carbon fiber uh, becomes on a magnitude of, of five times. In, in a going forward, uh, we take the very labor intensive carbon fiber parts that are laid up by hand today and companies around the world are, are racing towards uh, trying to get these parts uh, manufactured at a, at a much lower cost, uh, but yet still still be flyable. So here's an example of, of an article uh, just from this last week in Composites World uh, where you know Airbus is sponsoring the the Wing of Tomorrow program here and and a 
thermoplastic composite rib uh, is is being provided as a demonstrator to to prove out that reliability of that technology and uh, thermoplastic composites is is really using technology that we would consider to be old technology in automotive to to adapt to uh, something that that is a very low volume application compared to automotive. Uh, I had the privilege last week while I was in Italy uh, to tour one of Persico's facilities uh, just outside of Bergamo. And, and Persico is another Italian manufacturer that, that is really active worldwide, uh, like Bellotti, in, in helping industry uh, drive down cost. And they were, they were kind enough to share a few slides uh, for this presentation today. Uh, where they're they're working on taking technology that that is old technology from automotive and forming and cutting in one step in the mold uh, parts that are typical aerospace parts. So here you see a, a few parts from uh, helicopter applications. And what what even though uh, Persico is a customer of Bellotti's, uh, what interests me the most, in, in a going forward perspective is the faster these parts uh, can be produced, the, the more demand there is on companies like Bellotti to be able to machine the parts uh, more efficiently to try to keep pace uh, with folks like Persico. So the next few slides here uh, will just be some of the, the small examples that, that we see uh, Helping aerospace in in the you know the coming years, uh, those tier two, tier three suppliers become more efficient. Uh, so the more efficient they become, uh, lower cost, and and the closer we can come to uh, that that automotive uh, let's say pace. So here's a simple example of of a device. That, that in the machine tool industry is, is very common, but uh, in, in composites machining, not so common. What this does is give you the ability to introduce a fixture, uh, reintroduce a fixture to a machine tool and, and have it repeatable, uh, the virtually perfect, you know, within microns. And here's a, an example of, of a, a customer that is a tier three supplier to an aircraft manufacturer. And, and we hear that this was a, a purpose built, a purpose, let's say specified machine uh, that incorporates a real short part on a zero point tool that allows, as you see in the lower right hand corner, uh, a longer part. And so within a minute or two, uh, you can change over from trimming and, and drilling a very short part to something that's longer. And of course, the configuration can be, you know, anything the application requires. So here's a little closer view of the type of part uh, that is being machined in that machine. And, and you know, here's a, an application where carbon fiber is being machined uh, wet. Uh, as opposed to to dry. Another example uh, here, you see a, a machine that's 23 meters long and and 7.2 meters wide and has a z-axis four and a half meters. We can divide this down the middle or divide it across the center uh, and be able to uh, load and unload on one end while we're machining on the other end. Again, it, it all in the uh, the objective being uh, to keep the machine running constantly, uh, as opposed to these long periods of time uh, down machine while we're unloading or reloading a part or a fixture or both. Here's a smaller example of that where we'll introduce shuttle tables where we can be machining inside the machine here on, on one table while we're unloading or reloading, maybe exchanging the fixture on another table and, and then these will alternate back and forth. Here's 
an example of taking that one step further where we've got a machine tool uh, that has two spindles, two five axis heads that can be machining two different type of parts in a machine while the operator is out on the outside of the machine uh, unloading or reloading. At the end of this cycle, this table rotates 180 degrees and introduces the two tools that you see in the foreground uh, and exchange those for the ones in the background or inside the machine envelope. Here's one of the earlier slides uh, illustrating just the divider here that we've got that allow us to unload reload at one end while we're machining on the, the uh, other end. If, if we look at these uh, raised pods here, you notice that, that these are fixed in the floor. Uh, something in a, in a going forward, so the future, uh, is that we're starting to drive these, these rows in and out of the machine, uh, drive these electronically back and forth to suit the, the part. So here you see the, the machine uh, illustrated from the end of the, the uh, machine. The purpose here is there's applications where you may want to have an installation where you've got a typical cast iron T-slot table and have all of these uh, universal uh, fixtures outside of the machine and then uh, let's say on the the this afternoon or tomorrow, uh, you've got an application similar to those that that I showed earlier, and you want to drive some of these or all of these into the machine over that cast iron T-slot table to create a, a very flexible machine tool. Here's a, a view of that uh, machine from the side, showing one of these driven down to the other end of the machine couple of them in the machine and the rest still, still stacked outside of the machine. We've got a speaker a little later on uh, that'll, that'll go into a great deal of detail on, on uh, 3D printing or advanced additive manufacturing. Uh, Bilotti has partnered with a company in the Netherlands by the name of Seed to create a trade name Bead where we'll take Seed's additive technology and, and install that in our large machines. Uh, so we'll have uh, applications, for example, uh, here where we'll print very large tools for nautical and aerospace industry, whether those are plugs, molds, uh, tools for autoclave uh, curing. And, and uh, we, we really look forward to bringing that uh, to this this uh, aerospace market. Here's a quick shot of a rendering of, of what that'll look like. Seed here is their contact information. If you want to uh, look into that, here's our mothership contact information. A few details on them and uh, my contact information. Uh, my colleagues in Italy, their contact information as well. And it's been a pleasure presenting and I, I look forward to any questions that may be uh, present or if somebody has something that they'd like to ask that's confidential, uh, feel free to email me or, or telephone me. Thank you, Antonio. Antonio, you're on mute. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Hammer. Uh, it was uh, it was interesting, um, uh, interesting the 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 adjustment that I mean the fact that your company is trying to um, use uh, uh, established technologies in in in, uh, in new applications or new ways. Uh, I have a question for uh, for you. Um, although it's about 3D printing. So the question is, uh, how does improvement and uh, uh, ex expansion in 3D printing technology impact your business model, if at all? 
and how are you adapting to this technology? If you if you're gonna have a, a brief, I mean, a brief answer, um, you know, a couple of minutes. Thank you. Yeah. So, if I could answer it this way, Antonio, what what really interests us about 3D printing is uh, there there are a lot of applications uh, where where we feel our uh, typical customer has a need to print a, a large tool of some kind. And, and that, that printing is going to be much more efficient, uh, again, driving costs down. Uh, and, and so we see it as, as a, a very interesting technology to drive their costs down. And, and we feel, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that uh, I shouldn't I shouldn't say it's rocket science, but it's it's something that we feel very complementary to our existing uh, technology. So uh, it's it's really about helping the customer become uh, more cost effective, more competitive. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hammer. Um, appreciate your time. Appreciate your. Uh um your information um i um like to move now to the next speaker uh mr uh, william sunik jr is uh the head of um he, he works for uh, um uh, leonardo helicopters and augusta westland in philadelphia and uh, he's the head of uh, tilt rotor marketing um, and is responsible for the development of marketing and business uh, strategies for his, uh, and prior to joining Leonardo Helicopters, Mr. Sunik held numerous uh, leadership positions uh, at the Boeing company within strategy marketing, sales, market development and engineering. He was also a member of the presidential helicopter team while he was at Sikorsky Aircraft uh, Aircrafts in uh, 1992. Uh, please, Mr. Sunik. Thank you, Antonio. I am going to share my screen here. Okay, hopefully that's working. And let me start. Wonderful. Okay. I can see. Okay, let's go to presentation mode. Okay, outstanding. Uh, hopefully you can see just the slide now. Is that yep. correct? That's good. Wonderful, wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you here today. Um, to share with you uh, perspectives on uh, innovation within aerospace. Uh, as head of tilt rotor marketing for Leonardo Helicopters, uh, I'm excited to share with you several innovative technologies we are working on today and for the future. Uh, a little background here about uh, Leonardo. Uh, approximately 50,000 employees worldwide uh, headquartered in Italy, in Rome but spanning the full spectrum of aerospace and defense solutions uh, across uh, multiple domains, uh, air, land, sea, space, uh, cyberspace, and unmanned. Uh, and the common denominator I'd say is a, a full breadth of customer support uh, services and training options uh, across all those products and systems. Um, now to go in a little more detail, as I mentioned before, I'm a member of the uh, air domain, a helicopters unit, and to take a little closer investigation with that, I'd like to share with you the uh, product portfolio um, within Leonardo Helicopters. And this was Heritage Augusta uh, and Westland Helicopters in the UK. And you see our portfolio there, um, and it's bounded by two uh, horizontal bands, one in blue, uh, denoting the Civil War commercial uh, helicopter rotocraft lineup, uh, and another uh, denoted in green, uh, filter uh, indicating the military or government use platforms. Um, so you'll see extensive product range across all weight categories. Um, and predominantly uh, 
we have dual use platforms. Uh, as we say, civil as possible, but military where necessary. So in here in those designs are both civil and military applications. And I like to point out and start with um, one aircraft in particular and, and share with you this family concept of innovation that we're currently utilizing. And that starts um, in an in intermediate class, the AW139 uh, there in the blue and then repeated um, also uh, uh, capabilities in the green. But um, ironically, 20 years ago, this past February, we, um, we had the first flight of that aircraft. And over the 20 years that has evolved and is now the best-selling intermediate twin engine helicopter uh, across the world. Uh, in fact, we've recently delivered our 1,000th aircraft. Um, but starting with that uh, design and, and that philosophy here, uh, we expanded that uh, across our product range to a larger uh, twin engine, a medium or super medium, as some would say, the AW189, uh, and then a smaller, a light intermediate uh, twin engine helicopter, the AW169. But sharing that same AW139 design philosophy, certification and standards or, or DNA, as we say. And what that equates to uh, in terms of operator innovation is, is a 20% commonality of parts across all three of those airframes, a 30% commonality uh, in maintenance tools and ground support equipment, and 40% reduction in overall training time for maintainers and air crew. Um, so a lot of, a lot of um, uh, investigation goes into the acquisition costs of an aircraft, which uh, is a very large uh, component of costs. But when you're employing aircraft over a number of years or decades going out 20 or 30 years, the acquisition cost is actually a very, very small uh, component of the overall cost. And really it's the logistics tail or the life cycle cost of that aircraft, the parts, the tools, maintaining the tools, the ground support equipment, and then the training uh, for the multiple air crews and maintainers that will, that will be part of that aircraft through its lifetimes. That is the true, that is the biggest cost driver. So having those savings and those synergies across those three aircraft, that family concept, that's operational efficiency, that's real world innovation for our operators. And that's tangible results that they can benefit to today that we're really, really proud of. Now, going forward from that, I'd like to share with you a new aircraft we're developing. In fact, it's a new class of aircraft, the AW609 tilt rotor. Um, You'll notice uh, in the photo there on the slide, uh, it harnesses tilt rotor technology. It has twin uh, nacelles uh, with twin engines um, that enables it to take off vertically and fly very similar to a helicopter. Um, however, those nacelles rotate and they rotate 90 degrees down and enables it to fly like a fixed wing twin turboprop airplane. Um, and what that does uh, it, it enables the best of both worlds, really. It enables the runway independence of a helicopter that you can just about take off anywhere or have the, the capability of vertical maneuver during your flight, uh, mid-mission hover, things like that, um, with the excellent uh, and higher speeds, uh, longer ranges, and higher altitudes uh, afforded by turboprop airplanes over helicopters. So you really have the best of both worlds in that tilt rotor technology. Uh, that's one technology, but now adding to that uh, composites and, and Todd did a, a great job, enjoyed his presentation talking about composite technology, which began on the military side and we see it going on to the commercial side in airliners. Um, and now we're starting to see it um, in rotorcraft first again on the military side, but now on the commercial side. So the AW609 takes full advantage of that and has um, principal structures made of composites. Uh, and then even going a, a step further, um, our airframe, the cabin section is pressurized, which is unheard of in any rotorcraft. Helicopters fly lower, uh, they're bounded uh, to you know about 10, 
thousand feet operationally, some you know go a little higher, but then you need some supplemental oxygen, things like that. But for a commercial helicopter, 10,000 feet is about the limit. But having a pressurized cabin, as the AW609 does, enables you to fully exploit the twin turboprop light cruise mode to fly at higher altitudes of between 20 and 25,000 feet. So what that enables uh, is you to fly over obstacles like mountain ranges, whereas a traditional helicopter would have to take a more circuitous routing uh, through the valleys or whatnot, or even an obstacle like a bad weather system, you know, out there uh, 15 or 20,000 feet that you can literally fly over that and enjoy direct routing instead of a more longer, more circuitous routing. Uh, also at airspeed, you're flying in the smoother air uh, and you have higher airspeed advantages due to that altitude here. Um, now, in the unlikely um, event that you are at a higher condition and you have um, uh, icing, uh, we have a uh, full ice protection system uh, employed in the aircraft to enable flight into known icing conditions. So to really exploit that altitude advantage there. And then finally, a fly-by-wire flight control system. So uh, in old days, we used to have mechanical linkages going from the pilot's uh, uh, control sticks into the control surface here, but we have multiple helicopter-like control surfaces and fixed-wing airplane-like control surfaces. Now, in the cockpit, the pilot uh, would be very familiar um, from a helicopter perspective to our inputs. We have a center stick, uh, rudder pedals for the feet, and then uh, what a traditional helicopter pilot would call a collective lever uh, we have, but it's a power control lever because in airplane mode, obviously it behaves more similar to a, a throttle. Um, but uh, having a computer in the loop there, we're able to take the pilot's inputs and, and translate those into the desired control system, control actuation to get that desired effect that the pilot wants to command. They don't have to worry about where they are within the flight regime if they're flying you know, as a as a helicopter within the cells vertically or down as a um, twin turboprop airplane within the cells oriented at zero degrees. The flight control fly-by-wire uh, computer system figures all that out and the pilot continues to input via the traditional helicopter light controls. But it's truly the summation of those five technologies, tilt rotor technology, composite pressurized airframe, fly-by-wire flight control system, and a full ice protection system uh, that makes the AW609 one of a kind. No other aircraft on the planet has a summation of those five technologies here. And I would uh, make a comparison to uh, the iPhone. When the iPhone was introduced, um, it wasn't the first uh, phone to have an internet browser. Uh, there were other devices that had those out there. What it did was take those technologies and employ them in a user-friendly, in a, in a more manageable and usable uh, package. And that's what we believe we have here. These technologies have, out, have been out there. We are the only ones to combine all five of those in one platform uh, that we are really excited about the benefits that we can offer to our customers across multiple, multiple mission sets that we'll, see, we'll think they will see tremendous uh, operational synergies here. And then talk a little bit more about those uh, capabilities here, you know, of having the runway independence, the vertical maneuver of a helicopter with speed, the higher speeds, longer ranges and greater altitudes of a uh, twin turboprop uh, aircraft here. You know, a lot of it comes down to time. Um, now in the US, uh, a popular saying is time is money here. And, and where we're located in Philadelphia is arguably one of the most, it's kind of in the middle of the, one of the most uh, uh, traveled routes uh, uh, between two of the, really the two of the capitals within the United States the center of government, Washington, DC, and then the center of business and commerce, uh, New York City and Wall Street here. Um, that is uh, at best on a high speed train, a two and a half hour trip from Manhattan directly to downtown Washington, DC. Uh, there are airplane services you can take to fly from New York City 
to uh, Washington, D.C. However, they're a bit outside the city centers. Uh, they're not off Wall Street, right? They're a little further out and they don't land you in downtown Washington, D.C. So though it's an hour, you're going to have surface transit uh, to and from your uh, original point of origin and then your final destination here. But to have the point-to-point -point capability of the AW609 to uh, take off vertically from Wall Street and then fly in an hour land directly downtown Washington, D.C., that's a game changer. And so for a, a business executive that is overbooked in their time and whatnot, to be able to fly down uh, to Washington, D.C. from New York, conduct your business, and then make it back up uh, by lunchtime, uh, that's huge, right? And so time truly is money there. Uh, and now I would pivot toward uh, emergency medical services here, and, and time equates into, into a different savings here. Um, I've talked to a lot of uh, operators around the world uh, in remote regions that don't have the, the benefit of uh, hospital density that we enjoy here in the greater Philadelphia area. So they're all on, at long distances from the hospitals and more rural areas that to make a uh, pickup at a point of injury often involves multiple platforms, whether it's a car to drive to a opening or even a helicopter to fly to a regional airport, to then take a airplane, to travel to a metropolitan uh, airport, and then a helicopter or surface transport to the hospital, right? To have the capability to fly directly to the point of injury, to that um, full service metropolitan hospital that has a full capability across all, all ailments here, that, that's a game changer. And so that time savings, that can mean the difference between a, a permanent injury or not, right? Um, and now we even look toward search and rescue. And so traditionally, it's, it's a mixed fleet, what we call it. The search is done by a fixed wing airplane uh, because it has the longer range, uh, has a longer enduring um, uh, loiter time over the search area that can run a search pattern over to locate and identify those in distress, and then radio the uh, helicopter that has the shorter fuel reserves, but has a vertical maneuver capability to stop in mid-flight and make the pickup and, and rescue here for those in distress. So a time savings of having a platform that can do both of those jobs as two different platforms in one platform to do a fixed wing type search you know, locate on scene very, very quickly and have that loiter time to, uh, to perform a search and then prosecute the rescue with the uh, vertical uh, pickup of a winch uh, hoist of those in distress. And then the added capability of pressurized airframe uh, for some ailments, if it's a deep sea diver with a lung injury or things like that, to have sea level standard pressure available in the airframe, you know, that synergies between fixed wing and, and rotary wing that difference and savings in time could be the difference between life and death here. So really a lot of um, very tangible savings, depending on the operator here between those, uh, those capabilities here that's only afforded today in the AW609. And so, you know, looking at aviation history, it, it's steeped in improvements in, in speed and range and altitude. And you'll see here the AW609 is no different uh, compared to other commercial vertical lift platforms out there, uh, your typical helicopters or even compound helicopter technologies that employs auxiliary type propulsion devices. The AW609 uh, does better them in terms of speed, range, and altitude, but even goes a step further uh, in terms of noise or um, CO2 uh, burned during its flight here by flying more efficiently in, in using the benefit of a static wing, right? To fly off of that instead of a rotary wing here, we're able to get better noise signatures or less CO2 emissions produced. So um, taking a, a step back and, and looking at the entire history of aviation, um, you know, it, it's pretty uh, much been the same. Uh, we either drive or take a helicopter to an airport, uh, then to hop on a fixed wing airplane to fly to our destination and then drive to our final point uh, of our journey here. Um, 
we're really, really excited about offering a new way of flying here, of true point-to-point -point transportation. Uh, and you think, you know, back to the days of Star Trek when you kind of beam from one place to the other. Well, that's kind of the capability that the AW69 can afford here. The uh, vertical independence of a helicopter, speed, range, and altitudes of a fixed-wing airplane to, to offer true point-to-point -point, uh, transportation. And, and we think this is an exciting time in aviation uh, and think it's, it's about time that we demand more capability for, from our aircraft. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions you may have. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Sunik. Uh, um, I have a, an answer, a question that uh, um, requires a quick, uh, a quick answer. So uh, in case some, someone in the audience is interested, what is the price tag of uh, this uh, aircraft, roughly? So it varies on application. You saw multiple missions there, whether it's a uh, utility type, uh, oil, gas, uh, offshore energy resource development to search and rescue and EMS, uh, VIP, um, corporate type. Uh, so we're still um, setting the final price, but it, typically it'd be probably be between 25 and $30 million. Okay, two, five and three, nine between? Uh, 25 and, and three zero, 25 and 30. Okay, 30. okay. Um, okay. Th there is a question, but I'm, I'm not sure we have time. Sorry. Um, I'm, I am concerned. So, or, or do you have a, uh, let me see if you can answer quickly in one minute uh, to the question. Does the current infrastructure fully support the capability of these aircraft? If you can answer in one minute, please. Sure. So the AW609 uh, fits on existing helipads. Um, in fact, very similar to our AW189, the, the large medium I, I showed you before on our product portfolio, slightly larger than that. Um, if you're familiar with other uh, larger commercial helicopters like the S92 or H225, it actually fits in helipads smaller than that. Um, so that those infrastructures are already in place. Um, now, also, we have the benefit of being a tilt rotor. We can also use airports because uh, it is a excellent short takeoff and landing uh, aircraft, and it gets even better performance by having a little bit of a runway roll. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, we don't have time for a second question. Uh, maybe we can check later. Um, I'm, uh, um, I, I want to say something I forgot to mention that uh, this event will be uh, later posted on YouTube. Okay, so let's move to the next uh, uh, presenter, uh, Mr. Alessio Lorusso. He's uh, the CEO and founder of Robos, a, a 3D printing company. He was included in the Forbes 30 under 30 list 2018 as one of the most talented 30 European managers in the industry category, entrepreneur and visionary in the additive manufacturing field. He won the Entrepreneur of the Year Award by Ernest and Young. And when he was only 17, he built his first beltless beltless 3D printer, and in 2015, he founded Robos, doubling its turnover year after year. His goal is to uh, bring uh, um, value of producing at the point of use in favor of net economic advantages. Uh, please, Mr. LaRusso. What an introduction, Antonio. You set so high expectations now. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did not do you a favor, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very pleasure to be here today with you. So I'll share my screen. <clears throat> Could you please confirm that uh, you can see that? You can right. see that. Uh, 
Yep, yes. it is not uh, full screen yet, though. Uh, okay. No? Um, well, we can still see your uh, browser, at, uh, if that's okay. Are you going to scroll down in the browser? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. All right. right, all right. So my name is Alessio Lorusso. I'm the founder and the CEO of Robos. Um, I founded Robos in, uh, during 2015 with the goal to bring 3D printing and DT manufacturing to the, many, to, the, to the production, to the production shop floor. So our goal was since the beginning to produce real end use parts made in a repeatable way close to the point of use. So our technology today is helping many aerospace companies to produce the parts they need just in time and on demand. A quick overview about 3D printing in the aerospace industry. Currently, the technology is mainly used to create uh, prototypes, jigs, fixtures, molds for, for example, autoclave, a hand layup composite, molding, tooling in general. But um, the technology now is, is getting ready to produce real end use parts capable to fly more and more. So the expectations over the next eight years is that the 3D printing sector will reach almost 7 billion business in the aerospace sector, including hardware, so 3D printers, materials, and parts printed through service providers. So the, the adoption of the technology in the aerospace sector is becoming, is becoming huge year after year. In robots, we are specialized in composite material and super polymers. So our technology is being developed to create end use parts using super polymers like PIC and uh, PIC carbon fibers and ULTEM 9085 to replace metals in extreme applications. Here, for example, we are seeing an application of CubeSats printed with our technology uh, by the University of Colorado. And uh, thanks to the fact that they replace metals in these applications, especially aluminum, they had a cost saving around 88%, which is huge, and a mass reduction of uh, around 50%. So, of course, peak material is one of the most performing polymer in the entire world. Uh, we introduced for the first time in the energy manufacturing sector for FDM technology, so fused deposition modeling, the peak material back in 2016. So we were the first in the world to uh, make possible printing PEEK -E material, which is a very, uh, it's, it's not a very easy to process material because it requires very high temperature to be processed in terms of extrusion temperature and in terms of um, the process, the temperature in the heated chamber. So we process this material at 450 C. So very close to the, to the, to the melting point of, uh, of, of aluminum, for example. I'll be very fast because I understood that we are, we are late. So um, a quick overview about our technology. As I was explaining before, we are very concentrated and focused in the super polymers and composite materials. Today, we demonstrated that the technology is now ready and it's now capable to replace metals thanks to the fact that we reach incredible mechanical properties like 140 megapascal tensile strength. Um, and uh, mm, we certified material for aerospace use. So our materials are UL94V0 certified, so flame retardant smoke toxicity certification. And we are now ready to ensure the repeatability of the parts production thanks to our technology that we call beltless. So our 3D printers, as you can see, are more similar to CNC machine in the way our machines work 
um, we can ensure 10 microns accuracy and repeatability over time, thanks to the fact that our 3D printers don't use belts made in rubber-like material, but they use mechatronic gears to create very accurate and repeatable parts. We introduced some business models uh, in the last couple of years with intention to democratize more and more our technology. So today we provide our machines and materials with a subscription fee. And thanks to this, we are creating a huge number of uh, manufac small manufacturing hubs in the world that we call robust 3D parts partners. These partners are our customers that provide parts service to additional customers. So we are creating the, um, um, the connection between the demand of printed parts and the offer of of printing parts provided by, by our customers. Um, we are capable today to produce up to 10,000 parts uh, in the world in, uh, in very few days, asking our uh, clients to produce parts for us. Uh, at this point, we have more than 400 machines in 24 countries in the world. And we are uh, printing, we printed so far more than 50,000 of parts in, uh, in the last six months. Um, here we can see a very short application we, um, um, we did in the um, aeronautics sector. This, is, this application is, uh, is called hand layup composite molding. So here we are helping aerospace companies to replace aluminum or uh, generic metal molds with the peak filled with carbon fibers. The very good thing is that the, this material printed through our technology can outstand more than seven bars at uh, up to 180 C in the autoclave for composite part consolidation. So this is a, this is a very aerospace ready uh, material for very extreme applications. Um, at this point, uh, we are more than 100 employees and uh, we have two headquarters. The US headquarters is based in Houston, uh, where we have parts production capability and all our business operations. In, the, um, in Europe, in Italy, we have uh, R&D, uh, engineering and material science and, and, uh, and chemistry um, team. Uh, so we are uh, very um, interested in, uh, in getting in touch with, uh, with, uh, with people participating in these webinars. If you have any kind of questions or would you like to um, test and understand the capabilities offered by our technology, we will be very pleased to get in touch with you and uh, let, you, let you test and understand uh, what's today's possible thanks to the additive manufacturing. Thank you, Mr. LaRusso. Thank you very much. Uh, your presentation shows how uh, Italy stays um, um, up, up to speed with the, with the latest uh, uh, technologies. Uh, do, do you see, I have a question, do you see your composite materials for additive manufacturing, doing what, doing what conventional composites see, see them progressing on in aerospace applications as it happened to the um, to, to the conventional composites, and uh, yes, I mean yes or no, and what are your um, what do you think are the the the, the limitations to their um, implementation? Thanks, Antonio, for the question. Mm -hmm. I think that we we reached incredible performances, uh, and uh, so today we are already replacing aluminum and stainless steel materials and uh, and some composite parts as well. So thanks to the fact that additive manufacturing can provide um, incredible geometry, it's very difficult to be replicated by traditional composite production methods or traditional CNC machining, we are seeing more and more adoption of 
3D printing technology, especially for peak carbon peak and composite materials through our aerospace customers. We started, we started um, from toolings, uh, molding, but we are now expanding into, into flying parts more and more. So now we are at the point where we are, we are qualifying our technology as a production technology for flying parts with many aerospace companies. So I see a great adoption of the technology in the next years will be, will be a, a, a huge opportunity for the, for the 3D printing technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, My pleasure. And uh, we uh, switch to the next. Actually, I, I want to say again to the, no, not, not again, for the first time to the audience, please do not log off at the end of this symposium because uh, there will be a, a questionnaire with a few questions that will uh, uh, by itself uh, open up at the end uh, of the last presentation. So it only takes a couple of minutes. So, so stay connected. And um, please answer the few questions of this uh, uh, questionnaire. Uh, okay, so uh, let's move to the next uh, uh, speaker. Um, and uh, uh, his name is um, Mr. Salvatore De Nicola. And he uh, um, is here representing uh, Solvay Composite materials global business unit he has more than 20 years of experience in the composite industry as a researcher material and process engineer project leader and r d manager he holds a master in aeronautical engineering and a, an aircraft certification from cranfield university in uk he also has attended Bocconi School of Management and Wichita University in the US. Um, he will uh, 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 talk about composites for aerospace industry. Please, Mr. De Nicola. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. And uh, thank you also to Fit uh, Italia and uh, to the Italian Consulate for uh, inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be, to be with you today. Well, let's start about uh, uh, talking a uh, few words on, on, on Solvay. Uh, Solvay uh, was established in uh, 1863 by Anne Solvay, uh, who is the inventor of the process for producing soda ash. He was literally obsessed by innovation. Um, he was convinced that innovation and, uh, and progress are beneficial to both business and, and society. And for this reason, he introduced it in his company uh, for the first time uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century, the uh, social welfare introducing uh, paid vacations, uh, social security, and uh, starting from uh, uh, 1911, he uh, organized the famous Solvay conferences uh, by inviting uh, the most important scientists and, uh, of, the, of the time. And uh, let me say that after more than uh, 150 years, uh, Solvay is still literally obsessed by, uh, by innovation. And uh, uh, demonstration is that uh, a few years ago, uh, the Solar Impulse 2, uh, relying on the Solvay technologies, uh, it, uh, completed for the first time uh, a trip around the world without a, a single uh, drop of, uh, of fuel. Few numbers now. Uh, Solvay has more than uh, uh, 23,000 employees in uh, 74 countries. Last year, the net sales were about 9 billion of, uh, of euros. So there is a, a global leader in chemicals, in uh, materials, and in providing, generally speaking, solutions to the industry, in particular to aerospace industry, mobility, uh, electronic industries, and healthcare industries. However, 
even being a leader, uh, the company remained really focused on uh, people and uh, on sustainability of our business, in particular on uh, green solution to protect our, uh, our planet. Well, in the title of the presentation, uh, I said that composite are a newborn technology. Why newborn? Because if we look at the development timeline for, for metals, we can see that we have been using metals for 10,000 years now. Uh, and uh, even the alloys that we use today in the aerospace industry, like uh, aluminum alloys or some type of steels, have been already developed more than 100 years ago. Uh, while for, for composites, the story started uh, in the mid of, uh, of last century with uh, glass fibers, if we neglect the mud brick used in the, in, in the history. And uh, in particular, for, uh, uh, for thermoplastics, you can see that PEAK and uh, PPS and other thermoplastic polymer that are very important today in the aerospace industry uh, were developed uh, only uh, about 40 years ago. So uh, composite, we can say that are at their infancy, in particular as uh, fiber reinforced plastics, but evolved very quickly and evolved quickly as also deviation. aviation. Uh, today we live in a, in a, in a digital era uh, dominated by electronics, by uh, connection, smartphone, satellites, and probably we, we believe that this is the, the most exciting period for progress. But if we look at the, the story of, of aviation, we can see that uh, between the, the first flights and the first supersonic flights, uh, there are uh, less than 50 years. And it's incredible today to think that uh, just three years after the first flight of the Wright brothers, the Voisin brothers in France started with the, the first uh, plant to manufacture uh, aircraft. So uh, we, can, we can say that composites and aviations have for sure in common the rapid, the rapid developments. And uh, in particular, the introduction of uh, uh, composite into uh, the, the civil sector, into the aerostructure for, for civil sector, started in the 70s. Uh, and since then, uh, in, in 45 years, uh, the, uh, the use of composite materials increased more than 30 times, uh, with an annual growth rate, in some cases, higher than, than 10%. We can see that uh, in the 70s, only few aircraft adopted uh, uh, composite materials. And uh, on average, uh, the percentage of uh, composites in weight uh, was less than 10%. During the, the 90s, the number of aircraft using uh, composites increased dramatically. And, uh, uh, also, the percentage of usage of composites increases up to 30%. While in the last few years, uh, we have some examples like as the Boeing 787 or the Airbus A350 that uses more than 50% of composites in, uh, in weight. Well, which are the technologies that uh, were able to enable the use of uh, Composites in the in the uh, higher frame the structures. We can see here a direct correlations. Let's start for who is not very familiar with, with composite materials with uh, with the definition. Uh, composite materials can be uh, defined as uh, a material having at least two different phases and an interface. In few words, we can say that a composite material is made by fiber and matrix. And in the 70s, uh, several types of fiber were developed, like as Kevlar, E glass, standard models, carbon fiber, boron fibers. While on the racing side, um, the chemist, chemistry of, of epoxies made a, a giant step 
alle winter winter drills, uh, composite in the aircraft secondary structures like as uh, radome or uh, radar, uh, spoilers, uh, flappers, uh, other movable surfaces, both for commercial and uh, uh, military applications. During the 90s, another significant step ahead was made by the development of intermediate models carbon fiber and of uh, epoxy uh, using a toughening technologies. Toughened epoxy and intermediate carbon fibers open the door together with the BMI raisins for high temperature to the use of uh, composite materials for primary structures like as empennage or uh, primary structures for uh, defense application. In the same period, uh, started also some uh, automatic deposition uh, techniques for uh, aerospace, in particular, automatic tape laying or automatic fiber placements. And coming to our, uh, our days, uh, the racing for liquid infusion and the development of vacuum bag technologies uh, allow it to extend use of composite materials to uh, very large sectors, in particular to wind, to empennage, and for military applications, enabled the, 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 the range of aircraft missions for, for this aircraft. And uh, where we are today, in particular, we can identify three main technologies that are uh, making the difference in the aerospace industries. One is the uh, out of out the development of out of out of uh, materials. Again, for, for who is not very familiar with, with composites, composite materials are normally laid up and then are consolidated in uh, large autoclaves using high temperature, usually 180 degrees C and high pressure up to uh, 10 bars. Of course, this uh, implied the high cost, high manufacturing cost, and some issues in manufacturing very large structures. Now we developed uh, materials that are able to reach the same mechanical performance of classic composites, but without use of an autoclave. They can be cured in a, in a standard oven. And uh, this allow it to uh, extend the use of composite to very large structure. The second technology is liquid infusion. Liquid infusion allows to realize very complex parts, uh, like as the one that we see in the uh, example here. Uh, there are fan blades for uh, engine applications or very complex shapes like as the inch fitting that we see in, uh, in, in the picture. And the third one is particle toughening. Uh, I said before that uh, toughened epoxy uh, adds uh, a huge importance in the development of composite for aerospace. Uh, the adoption of uh, an innovative system um, to produce toughened resins and using in particular some microscopic particles uh, is allowing to uh, extend composites to some very thin structures. And this uh, makes possible use of composite materials also on uh, uh, small aircraft. Uh, Normally, in some areas, the fuselage of a, an aircraft is, can be less than one millimeter, and use of composite materials and so thin structures were not possible until a few years ago. While now, uh, with these new racing systems, everything is, uh, is more affordable and responsible. Well, what does the future hold? Uh, we believe that to grow Farther, composite must deliver more value. And uh, in particular, to address the needs of the emerging markets, uh, urban air mobility, uh, autonomous vehicles, electrical vehicles, 
sustainable solution for, uh, for mobility. And uh, we know that this more value is within the industrialization. Composites are now entering the industrialization era where uh, in some extent we can say that the production system can be more important than the product itself because a product that uh, is not sustainable, that cannot be uh, produced uh, easily and uh, respecting the increasing demands of the markets uh, will not be considered as competitive. And the answer we believe is in uh, mainly four technologies. One is press forming, another one is bonding, uh, third is function integration, and last, uh, and we have just seen the very interesting presentation from Mr. Lourdes on additive manufacturing. Okay, just a few more details on each of these technologies. Uh, on uh, stamping, uh, today, thanks to the uh, new chemistry and new processes developed by uh, Solvay, uh, press forming is possible for both thermoplastic and thermoset concepts. Press forming allows complex design and a very high manufacturing rate. Uh, we can introduce to aerospace finally something that uh, so far has been only dedicated to uh, automotive markets. The production of parts with a very high tack time, so parts produced in minutes instead of hours. This will make the difference for the new emerging market sectors, as I said before, like as urban air mobility, and also on very large aircraft, reducing the cost. The second interesting technology we are looking at is bonding. Today, the aircraft, both the metallic aircraft and the composite aircraft, use rivets, use millions of rivets. And this means uh, issues in terms of safety, in terms of weight, and in terms of uh, manufacturing problems. Because before installing the rivets, uh, the parts must be drilled and then riveted. Uh, bonding so far has never been considered as a structural alternative to rivets because it allows only a sort of mechanical addition between the procured composites and the, the other end. Uh, while today, thanks to the few supply novel uh, product developed recently, uh, we can ensure a chemical link between the parts. So after the uh, co-cure, the effect will be to have a monolithic part without any interface between the adhesive and the composite parts. And this, we are sure, will make the difference in terms of manufacturing of bonding of bonded parts. The third uh, aspect of uh, the uh, innovative technologies is functionalization. Uh, today, composites already provide uh, added functions to the structure. Um, the com composite protects the aircraft from lightning strikes protect composite from, uh, from fire, um, protect composite from uh, uh, electromagnetic interferences. But in the future, this uh, functionalization can definitely improve. Uh, one of the examples is to use composites as a sort of batteries for energy storage. Uh, more composites on, uh, on an aircraft would mean in the future, having more space for, for batteries, example. And uh, this opened the door to uh, full electric aircraft or aircraft relying on electricity more than on uh, uh, classic fuel for uh, services and uh, engines. 
And the last one is additive manufacturing. I don't want to add more words on, uh, on this. We really believe that this is the future in the wire. Starting from a simple, simple wire today, we can manufacture very complex parts. And uh, this is enabling uh, the use of composite materials on uh, uh, items that uh, so far have been only manufactured by, uh, by metals. In definitely, we can see that uh, composites uh, are a young technology, but the contribution to aerospace was for sure very decisive. And uh, this will remain the driver for the future. Uh, composite developments will be still driven by advanced bots in material science and in automation. So the composite materials can continue delivering an added value to aerospace and in general to, to our day by day life. But the attention to sustainability is, is increasing and we believe that will play for sure a critical role because the future must be, must be sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Ingeniere. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, let me see, I, uh, there is a question for you. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the next uh, plastic materials in additive manufacturing? Well, how do you see the evolution of this, of plastic, plastic materials in, in additive? Well, uh, one of the most uh, exciting uh, uh, innovations we are working on is the use of uh, materials having continuous fiber for additive manufacturing. Today, uh, we use uh, reinforced plastics for additive manufacturing, but with uh, what we call long fiber, but that as a matter of fact, are not comparable to the uh, continuous fiber that are used in, uh, let me say, legacy composite materials. But we are quite sure that in the near future, we will be able to realize composite parts by additive manufacturing with exactly the same properties of continuous fiber. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, was in the, your presentation was interesting because uh, you, you uh, shed some light on the role that um, the contribution that materials have in innovation in aerospace. So you touched on a different instead of on 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 the aircrafts themselves, you touched on the the contribution of of the materials, uh, particularly composites and plastic materials. So thank you for that. And um, and finally we switch from uh, companies to a university um we and and so the the the, the next and final speaker uh, is professor rosario pecora from the university of uh, naples and uh, he will uh, uh we, with him we will dive into the um uh, theory and analysis of uh, aircraft structures. Uh, and so a, a few uh, biographical notes about Professor Pecora. He um, has earned a master's degree in aeronautical engineering and a, a PhD in transport engineering. Um, he's also assistant professor of aircraft structures stability, uh, aircraft structures, stability, and lecturer of advanced aircraft structures uh, at the University of Naples, uh, Frederick II. He has worked uh, on uh, several aircraft, uh, has worked for several aircraft manufacturing companies, such as ATR, Alenia, Aermacchi, Bombardier, Piaggio, Aero Industries. And he also has worked for research centers as technical advisor. Um, his research activity is mainly focused on aereo servo elasticity, structures, dynamics, and smart structures. Um, again, with him, we will uh, we will learn about how 
innovation in aerospace can be uh, um, carried on uh, through uh, innovative uh, designs. Um, please, Professor Pegor. Thank you, Antonio, very much for your presentation. It's a pleasure for me to be here with all of you today. I'm starting to share my screen. Okay. You see my screen? Yep, looks good. Perfect. Let me use the laser pointer. Okay, so in uh, this uh, brief presentation, I will give you uh, an overview of the activities that we have been uh, carried out within the framework of the Clean Sky program with reference to the design and validation of a novel technology, a morphine wing flap specifically conceived for a large civil aircraft application. After a few words on the research framework, I will uh, drive you through the conceptual design phase of this technology and then uh, to the executive design and to the validation of the system. Finally, I will uh, give some comments on the next steps of the research and on all the improvements we are already making on the technology we have already validated. Well, our adventure started nearly 10 years ago in the Clean Sky program. For those of you who are not aware of what Clean Sky is, well, the Clean Sky is um, the largest research program that has been launched by European Union to specifically address all the technologies for the greening of the next generation aircraft and of the next generation air transportation. The program is very, very large. There are a lot of partners involved in it, small and medium enterprises, uh, big industries, academies and research centers, and there are a lot of technologies investigated. This complex research program is arranged in uh, different IADPs, which stands for Integrated Advanced Demonstration Platform. This means that all what is studied in the clean sky is specifically focused on an integrated platform for validation. So we are not making any kind of uh, academic or research exercise. We are doing something that has uh, to bring innovation, real innovation in the aircraft segment. The IDP we're working for is the Green Regional Aircraft EIDP. Uh, and this EIDP is basically identified with a real aircraft that has been conceived by Leonardo Aircraft into different configuration, open rotor configuration and, and uh, turboprop configuration. The turboprop is over here and the open rotor configuration is uh, over here. Well, why we have two different configuration? Because uh, this kind of configuration, the turboprop one was supposed to be the one that has to be flown in the very next future. This one was the configuration that is supposed to be flown in the far future. So all the major technologies have to be investigated with this, um, with reference to this kind of configuration, while the, the, the most breakthrough technologies like the morphing structures had to be investigated according to this specific kind of platform. Each EIDP and so also the GRA is characterized by different domains and each domain collects, you know, the technology for, uh, that, that, that belongs to a specific thematic area. We have been working in the low noise configuration domain of the GRA EIDP. And in the low noise configuration domain, there were the investigation of all the technologies that were aimed at reducing iframe noise, so noise pollution and also to improve the efficiency, the dynamic efficiency of the aircraft with the final goal of reducing the fuel burnt and consequently the air pollution. So we were uh, working, we have been working in the Green Ridge Aircraft IDP with reference to this kind of configuration, open rotor configuration to improve the efficiency of the aircraft through novel technologies in the structural field. So through morphing adaptive structures. Okay, that being said, uh, the first task that we received from the industrial partner, in this case, Leonardo Eifert that was managing the IDP was to make a proof of concept. Basically, we had to design, uh, manufacture and validate a morphic architecture that was enabling to, uh, uh, to, to modify the camber of a single flap element in compliance with target reference shape. Why this? The basic idea behind this kind of proof of concept was uh, very simple uh, in principle. 
The idea was to replace a classical double slot flap system that you can see here with a single slot flap system. When you do this kind of replacement, you have advantages in terms of complexity of the system, but you lose something in terms of aerodynamic efficiency in generating high lift for takeoff and landing, because you need much more camber, much more curvature for this kind of airfoil in order to reach the target of uh, the high lift you need for your aircraft. So the idea was to replace this uh, complex system with a simpler one, but characterize it by morphing capability. So it could be deployed out of the wing and cumbered. That means the shape of the flap could be changed by increasing the curvature of the airfoil itself. We worked as structural engineers in this task, and basically the way uh, according to which we had to morph the structure, so change the shape of the structure, was given to us by uh, other partners working in the aerodynamic field. So basically they discovered what was the target morphed shape of the airfoil we had to reach with our morphing structure in order to enable with this kind of configuration, the same high lift performance of the double slot system. As a constraint, this is very important to say, in the clean sky, we were obliged to not think about exotic solution, extravagant materials and stuff like that, because we had to stay with our foot on the ground and think about technologies that could be really implemented on a civil transportation aircraft in the next future. So technologies that could be ready for certification. So the idea that we uh, had, uh, the idea that we had to in find out a structural solution enabling the transition of the flap airfoil from a baseline unmorphed configuration here in red to a morphed one was to um, replace the, the classical rib structure, which is a unique piece, a unique plate, with a segmented structure characterized by multiple uh, plates connected along the middle line of the airfoil through hinges here represented with A, B, and C. Moreover, not consecutive element of the ribs were connected to crossed links here, this segment, and in the opposite side, this other segment. Thanks to this specific connection, basically we generated a single degree of freedom system, in the sense that if you think of moving each of this segment, all the other follow the movement according to a specific gear ratio across these hinges that is depending by the position of these links. So you may uh, think about this kind of rib as a finger, okay, as a finger of your hand. You cannot move the part of the finger of your hand in an independent way. You move one part of, unless you have problem, of course, in your hand. If you don't have any kind of problem, if you move just one part of your finger, okay, all the other parts follow of the movement because you have nerves inside your finger that generates some specific uh, gear ratio between the parts of the finger itself. So this rib follows this kind of concept. So it's a finger that has to uh, that, that allows the, the, the change of the shape of the airfoil. And if we play with the position of this crossed links, the nerves of your finger, you can basically obtain this transformation from this configuration to this configuration. Well, how you obtain this uh, transformation, of course, by introducing to your rib and actuators that move the ribs itself. Going into the 3D, okay, uh, along the span, you see how the things uh, worked in this proof of concept we, we elaborated. Basically, you recognize here the segmented rib, okay, uh, the segmented rib, and here we have a portion of the flap in true scale limited span. And you see that we have the three ribs delimiting two bays and some stiffening elements along the spanner to ensure the adequate stiffness in withstanding external load. Closer to each rib, we have a rotary actuator. The rotary actuator basically generates a rotation of a shaft that is perpendicular to the rib plane. This rotation in this direction through a gearbox is um, switched into a rotation in a direction that has in the chordwise, okay, a direction that is in the chordwise direction. This rotation in chordwise direction is transferred to an endless queue that moves up and uh, back on the forward the cursor, collocated to this uh, link to this leverage that moves finally this block up and down. So basically, this mechanical arrangement here. Um, allows uh, the actuator, the rotor actuators, to move up and down this block. 
While doing this, the action of the actuators is amplified through all these leverages. So we do not need any way very large actuators to move the flap under the action of the, the relevant loads that you have on this segment. Because you have to consider that when you are designing a morphing structure, you are designing a structure that has a double functionality. The basic functionality that is the one that it has to withstand load with adequate marginal safety. The second functionality, it has to do that while changing the shape. And that's to preserve the shape under the action of load itself. So these actuators are integral part of the structure in doing this reaction to the external loads. Of course, uh, uh, this this uh, conceptual this conceptual layout was the result of a very long process, a uh, very long design process from the concept identification up to the advanced design and also the kinematic design. Finally, we make up the, the demonstration of this uh, first concept. We manufactured a prototype all in aluminum alloy and we performed experimental tests on this small portion of the flap. Basically, we did static tests in order to see that uh, the, the device was able to withstand external load uh, with positive marginal safety with no permanent deformation. And then we uh, performed the ground vibration tests to understand how the dynamic of this um, uh, new kind of structure would have uh, influenced the dynamic of the structure of the wing where this flap has to be installed on. And then we made functionality tests to prove that we uh, we're able actually to morph the shape according uh, to the way that the, the, the aerodynamics uh, told us to do. So you can see in this video how this structure that is segmented uh, and is characterized by very conventional mechanical arrangement can actually change the shape in a very smooth way, okay? in a very smooth way that in compliance with what uh, was required by the analysis in terms of final shape of the flap segment. Of course, we have here now the reverse of the transformation. After this proof of concept, the, 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 the industrial partner we were working with, so Leonardo Arcat, was very happy and satisfied. And so basically they increased a little bit our budget and they uh, asked us to um, play a uh, more challenging task, in a more challenging task. So, okay, provided that you are able to uh, demonstrate that you can, uh, okay, morph a portion of the flap structure, let's now move uh, to the investigation of a larger portion of the flap. So basically they gave us as investigation domain, a wider portion of the flap, characterized by a span of 3.6 meters and uh, tapering um, configura tapered configuration with a root short of 1.2 meters and a tip short of uh, 1.2 uh, meters. So we had to, to sorry, tip short of 0 0.9 meters. We had to, um, you know, demonstrate that we were able to morph this kind of structure, but with reference to a wider domain and with reference to another important requirement that we uh, had to implement two different kinds of morphing capabilities. So not just one morphing mode, as you saw before that the iPhone changed the shape, but two morphing modes. What are these two morphing modes and why? The first morphing mode is the overall camber morphing of the, the airfoil, as you have seen before in the proof of concept. So basically you change all the curvature of the airfoil, all the camber of the airfoil. And you are supposed to implement this kind of, um, of morphing mode when the flap is deployed, so it's out of the wing. Why you do that? Because by cumbering, you increase the uh, performance of the aircraft in generating high lift. And so you need in takeoff and landing a higher lift. And so you morph this part completely. When you are in cruise and the flap is stowed in the wing, just this portion of the flaps that comes out of the wing was required to move up and down in order to uh, control somehow the load distribution on the wing and to have some advantage in terms of aerodynamic efficiency. So we had to assure two different kind of morphing modes that were also associated to different kind of zones of areas of the flap that had to be um, basically morphed. 
The first concept we elaborated to solve this problem, to, to solve this hard problem, was to somehow um, extend the degrees of freedom of the finger-like rib that we had um, uh, that we have generated in the first phase of the project. And the, the, the most simple way to do that was to make that crossed links, the nerves of the finger-like rib, extendable. So you have always the same arrangement of the rib that you, we, I showed you before, but one of the link, this one, can be extended in length. Why this? Because if you extend this link in length, basically you can generate a torque around this hinge and you can move up and down the last portion of the flap as it was required. So with this arrangement, we have a double actuation for the rib. One actuator drives the, the, the classical leverage that we have seen before. And with this actuator stopped, that, and this means that this length is fixed, all the flaps change the overall camber. When this actuator stops, the flap is fixed in a shape. This actuator can be activated. And this activation, thanks to a particular gearbox, generates the extension and the contraction of this link, just moving this part only. We went through the overall 3D design also of this kind of architecture. This is how the architecture looked like also in this fancy rendering mounted on a real aircraft. And please consider that we have here uh, for all the ribs involved in this layout, two actuators per, per two rotary actuators per rib. This is just an, an extension of uh, what we have seen in the first uh, preliminary proof of concept. We solved the problem of the tapering, just tapering the trailing edge and leading edge of the flap while keeping a constant short here where all the mechanics is installed. In this way, we were able to preserve the, the fact that all the hinge lines of these ribs were orthogonal to the rib plane, thus avoiding a lot of complication and problems of jamming during the, the, the morphing. While we perform all our investigation, we came out with the executive layout that uh, finally was rejected by ourselves because was not complying with a very important requirement. We had to, 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 to keep in mind that we were developing new technologies for civil aviation. Okay, so, okay, we can do morphing, we can change the shape of the flap, but we have to think about the fact that it has to be convenient, not only for uh, the uh, impact on aerodynamics, but also for the impact on maintenance and installation and, and all other issues. So this kind of architecture was too complex, okay, to be proposed for real industrial implementation because it had many actuators, many pieces. So we wanted to simplify it a lot. And we finally found out that there's a revolutionary layout for the RIP, much more compact than the one that you have seen before. The RIP is always actuated by two different rotary actuators, but this time the actuators are not just dedicated to one RIP only, but to the two RIPs that are delimiting each bay of the flap. Moreover, the mechanics was uh, really improved. As you can see here, uh, we have a finger-like structure for the first three elements. So these first three elements are mechanically linked and connected. So this means that if we um, move just one of these three elements with respect to the other, all the, the, the three elements moves as a single degree of freedom system. This actuator basically was dedicated to the motion, to the cumbering of these three elements that you see here, while this one was dedicated only to the flap tabs, to the last segment. So when we had to implement the overall camber morphing, both the actuator had to move and they had to move in a synchronous way in order to reach the shape we wanted for aerodynamic reason. When the flap was stowed in the wing, uh, this actuator was stopped and just this actuation was uh, functioning, just moving up and down the flap tab for load control functionalities. All these mechanics that you see here inside were just internal leverages in order to amplify the action of the actuators. Because one of the important requirements in the clean sky is that we had to use electric actuation. We had to go in the direction of all the electric aircraft. When you use electric actuation, you do not have so much torque at your disposal. So you have to figure out somehow how to amplify it some, through some mechanical leverages and mechanical amplification. 
This is the layout, how it appears um, after all the optimization study we did. Uh, basically, you see, uh, we have a couple of actuations for bay per bay, not all, um, per rib. So we uh, reduce a lot the number of actuators needed. Moreover, not all the bays are actuated. Uh, the bays are actuated. Here we install the controller for the segment. Of course, this is uh, was just you know, something that we did for, uh, because it was much more comfortable for us for demonstration purpose to have everything inside the, the demonstrator. But of course, for real aircraft application, this controller must be placed into the fuselage. And um, all these uh, actuators work in a synchronous way with the specific control logic we implemented. Basically, we have a primary line of actuators and a secondary line of actuators. This line moves when uh, we had to move just this uh, last portion of the flap. And this uh, one, together with this one, moves all together to morph the entire cumber of the flap itself. The entire set of actuators is linked to the rib here through some harmonic drive gear reducer, which amplify a lot of the torque coming from the actuation by 120 times. So we have small energy required and high torque provided. Moreover, we have another amplification inside the rib itself um, that uh, further amplified by uh, 13 times the torque coming out from the harmonic drive gear reducer. As you can see here, there is a missing element in the structure. I didn't show it intentionally, is the skin. When you, uh, you design a morphing structure, you have to think about a skin that is able to accommodate the change of shape. And you have basically two kinds of ways to think about your, your skin. You can think about a stretchable skin, so a skin that is very elastic, that can be uh, stretched and compressed. And you can think about a segmented skin, okay? Like in this other layout that is composed by different segments that can slide on each other. The first one, it's much more, you know, performing from the dynamic standpoint. The second one is much more performing from the maintenance standpoint, from the construction standpoint, from the robustness standpoint, and for a lot of other things. We were very lucky because uh, during that period where we were designing for the Clean Sky, we have been involved as uh, design leaders for the Morphine Trilling Gauge in Saristu project, led by Airbus, and in another project where we um, were leader for the design of a morphine gathering for a Bombardier regional, air, uh, regional aircraft. In both the, this project, we were dealing with the design and manufacturing of the morphine devices, and we also had the opportunity of test them into the wind tunnel. Well, what we discovered is that even if you have small gaps with a segmented skin, you do not have a great influence on the dynamic standpoint because of the position of your uh, trailing gauge, in our case of the flap. The flow is not so clean in that area, so you are uh, you know, more keen to accept some aerodynamic, um, some lower aerodynamic, lower aerodynamic performance due to the gap, because you want to gain advantages in terms of production and um, you know, also maintenance of your final layout. So for the flap, it was considered not reasonable to go on this kind of solution, very smooth solution, because it was proved that no adventures, real relevant adventures in, from the running standpoint could have been achieved. Uh, and so we implemented the armadillo-like scheme for the architecture I showed you before. Basically, we have different segments sliding on each other. Here, it's the that is represented the structure, uh, skin and structure in overall cumber morphing mode. And here, in the second uh, secondary morphing mode, where just the top is moved, uh, top is moved uh, downwards and um, upwards for load control capabilities. A zoom of the skin has just to show you how it was conceived. You have here silicon seals in order to avoid the, the flow leakage um, around the panels. So to anyway assure a very, very smooth aerodynamic flow. Uh, hey, uh, just to uh, cut in briefly, um, we're coming close to the time. Yeah, uh, I'm finished. You're, you're just, finished? Oh. Yes, just, just a couple of video to see uh, at the end of the game how it works. Great, yeah. okay. thank you. So it was just not an exercise. We actually made a static test on this device up to the limit load that was uh, 1.5 tons and the structure well resisted, uh, remaining in the elastic field. 
and here is the unloading. Consider that this, this shape is also kept by the actuation itself. And here you have you know, a video in order to show you how the structure actually morphs. Okay, this is the overall morphing mode of the of the of the system. Morphing mode one. And here we have the tail of the actuation and morphing mode two, just this part is moving. Some details of the transmission line with a very sophisticated solution to avoid undetected failures. And here you have the secondary morphing mode that is supposed to occur when the flap is stowed in the wing. Okay, as next steps, okay, just a few words. We are now in the Clean Sky 2 program. We are dealing with the true scale, uh, also in the span length flap design and manufacturing. Then this time we are showing three different morphing modes, the two that you have already seen, plus a twist of the top. We are now in the executive design phase. We are supposed to do the wind tunnel testing by the end of this year. And next year, we will have the ground validation of the full uh, demonstrator, full size demonstrator. So let's hope that we will be successful also with that challenge. So thank you for your attention and greetings from uh, Napoli. Saluti da Napoli. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pecora. Uh, I know we're uh, short on time, but uh, it, it was fascinating presentation because um, you let us uh, take a peek in the near future of uh, uh, airplane structures and uh, also a peek inside the airplane wings, right? We, we only see the skin, we don't see the inside. So um, I'm not sure we feel safer or less safer, less safe now flying. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, I, I have a question for you. Um, let me see if we can do it, if you can if you have a quick answer. Um, is the weight of the, the morphing fl flap greater than the weight of a conventional flap? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, this is a classic question. The weight is, uh, of course, greater because you are dealing with a structure that does something more. So you have some equipment installed on it. But what is important to say is that what you pay in terms of weight is gained in terms of efficiency that you obtain at the ceramic level. So uh, the balance is positive at the end of the game. Okay. Thank you, Professor. And in, I'm uh, uh, um, closing this, uh, uh, this event. Um, uh, many thanks uh, again to our esteemed speakers and their organizations. Um, thanks to the Italian Consulate and Phil Italia International. Uh, thanks to Iber Design. And uh, uh, many thanks to uh, those who attended our uh, uh, event today. Uh, we hope that you will uh, uh, um, uh, be back in one month for a, a symposium on additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Um, uh, ringrazio coloro che uh, uh, um, hanno assistito a questo evento e uh, do a loro l'arrivederci tra un mese uh, per un, uh, un, un altro evento uh, che riguarderà uh, la um, stampa a tre dimensioni o additive manufacturing. Uh, and finally, a last reminder about uh, the survey that will uh, automatically open up uh, when you leave this event. Again, thank you very much to everybody, especially the speakers. Uh, they made this uh, event uh, uh, very interesting. And uh, I will see you, the audience, in, uh, in about one month. Antonio, Antonio, posso dire qualcosa? Prego, prego. Sì, complimenti, veramente complimenti. Uh, compliments to all of you. I just wanted to let you know that we have an ex a program of expansion. If you know anybody, any leaders who is interested in starting a chapter in the, any location, let us know. We're going to Latin America soon. And uh, è stato un piacere ascoltare tutti voi. Professore Rosario Pecora, abbiamo due chapter in Campania. Una a Salerno con uh, la bravissima professoressa Sara Carbone e una a Napoli con uh, Michela Mortella. Arrivederci, io sono calabrese. Ciao. Arrivederci, arrivederci. Piacere. Arrivederci, ciao. goodbye to the next time. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. Grazie Antonio. Grazie. Prego, prego.
Okay, closing.